For over 10, For over years, 10 years, we at Climate One have been, have been engaging policymakers, policy influencers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. Thanks for joining us for this live stream program featuring the legacy of climate champion, Mary Nichols. I'm back in the Commonwealth Club today with a handful of crew wearing masks and physically distanced. We'd love to hear from you today, so please share your questions in the comments section of the live stream, or you can tweet them at us using our handle at Climate One. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio and podcast that drops every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your pods. Mary Nichols is not a household name, but she arguably has done more than any other public official to reduce America's carbon pollution. She's beat oil companies in court many times and has crafted detailed rules that are cutting pollution in China, Canada, and other countries. She first serves as chair of California's Air Resources Board, or the Air Board, from 1979 to 1983 and Democrat Governor Jerry Brown's first term. When she returned to the job almost 25 years later under a Republican governor, the board had evolved into a much more powerful and important player in what had become an urgent struggle against climate change. Climate One's Andrew Stelzer brings us some highlights of the Air Board's rise to prominence. In September of 2006, Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger went against the grain of his party and signed the country's first major law confronting climate change. To sign this bill, we will be begin a bold new era of environmental protection here in California that will change the course of history. AB 32, where the Global Warming Solutions Act is the country's strongest climate change law and aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. We can do this simultaneously. We can make the economy grow and also protect our environment. The following year, the governor appointed Mary Nichols to head California's Air Resources Board. The agency was given authority to write the rules on an economy-wide transition away from fossil fuels. Before they got very far, the subprime mortgage crisis plunged the country into the Great Recession. The oil industry seized the moment to fight back by putting a measure on the state ballot. Two Texas oil companies have a deceptive scheme to take us backwards. They're spending millions pushing Prop 23, which would kill clean energy standards, keep us addicted to costly, polluting oil, and threaten hundreds of thousands of California jobs. In 2010, voters rejected the ballot initiative, strengthening the Air Board's hand. A few weeks later, when climate talks in Copenhagen failed to produce a global agreement, California's progress was a lonely environmental bright spot. Over the next few years, the board fought off several lawsuits designed to reduce its regulatory power. Then, in 2015, the Dieselgate scandal put the agency on the international stage. What has VW been up to? Essentially, the car company was cheating on the very strict emissions tests by getting cars to give false Reading. Here's Air Board Chair Mary Nichols. Uh, the Air Resources Board and our engineers are the ones who uncovered the fraud and figured out how it actually worked. And we immediately brought in the uh, Federal Environmental Protection Agency and in turn the Department of Justice. Volkswagen reaches a deal to buy back or fix half a million U.S. cars involved in the emissions cheat. The company says the price tag for the crisis is double its original estimate. It sets aside about $18 billion to deal with the cost of the scandal. Former California State Attorney General Kamala Harris. 
Um, it is the largest settlement ever with an automaker. Um, it is the largest settlement ever um, in the context of the Clean Air Act and, um, and in the context of enforcement of our environmental laws. As part of the settlement, VW created a new $2 billion zero emission vehicle initiative. The move helped spark EV investment throughout the auto industry. California's Air Board was able to help turn a pollution crisis into progress, moving not just California, but the entire country towards a lower carbon future. For Climate One, I'm Andrew Stelzer. Stelzer. Okay, we're waiting for Mary Nichols. We had a little bit of a technical issue. Uh, uh, that was a story of uh, the powerful California Air Resources Board, chaired by Mar Mary Nichols for the last 13 years. We're waiting to get Mary back on Zoom. Um, so the technical gremlins uh, came at us and was waiting for Mary. Looks like she's in the waiting room on Zoom right now and real excited to talk to her. I think Here I am. Yay. There she is. She's <laughs> Back. I think I must have clicked the wrong button somewhere, <laughs> but here I am. I'm back. Welcome to Climate One, Mary. Thank you. I think uh, we first met, I don't know, back there around 2000, 2007, 2008. Um, yes. In, in 2007, Governor Schwarzenegger fired the chair of the California Air Board, and his chief of staff called you asking for suggestions to, for replacements. What did you say on that phone call? I can't quote my words exactly, but it was something like, well, I'd consider doing it myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's, I pretty much nominated myself. <laughs> and why did you become an environmental lawyer? What was sort of your path, your inspiration? You had chaired the air board, you're a lawyer. What was your kind of your inspiration and story to becoming um, the career path that you set on? Well, I was an activist before I was an environmentalist. I mean, I grew up in a lovely place in upstate New York, Ithaca, New York, and had, you know, experiences hiking and camping, et cetera. But really, um, the whole issue of the environment as a political issue didn't exist uh, when I was growing up. And there was no such thing as a, an environmentalist, really. There was a Sierra Club. They'd been around, but they were not particularly big in my part of the world. Uh, what tipped it was Earth Day in 1970, and then the rise of a whole new generation of you know, young lawyers and other kinds of organizers and activists uh, who saw the environment as something that was in need of action by the government, or either to stop bad things from happening or to create better conditions for nature, for wildlife, et cetera. And um, as someone who had gone to law school inspired by my experiences in the South and the civil rights movement, I realized that that was an issue which was going to be taken over by the people who were on the front lines of the struggle, meaning mostly African-American people and, um, you know, to some extent, people who were working with them side by side in the community, uh, but that uh, as a lawyer, it was not the place where I should be focusing my uh, principal attention and that I should be looking to what else needed to be done. Uh, I graduated from Yale Law School in 1971. I was married at that point. Uh, my husband wanted to move to Southern California to practice law. He had spent the summer out here and loved it. Uh, and I was happy to get away from the East Coast and the winter and into a place of opportunity. So I landed in LA without a job and went looking for something in the public interest arena. And I happened to land just at the same time as an organization called the Center for Law and the Public Interest, or CLIPI, was getting started. And uh, they had made environmental law their principal activity, although they did actually get involved in some uh, equal opportunity, equal rights litigation, equal employment uh, work especially. But the but their main focus was the environment. And so I went and applied. At that point, I hadn't taken the California bar. So I was just a, a student, an ex, just a graduate of law school who needed to take the California bar. So they hired me as a law clerk. 
And then um, I succeeded in convincing them that they needed to keep me around because I took on the one topic that everybody agreed was really important, but they didn't know what to do about it. And that was air pollution. Excellent. Mira, I want to ask you to move that boom on that mic down just to tabs because we're getting a little bit of, yeah, if you could move it away from your chin, yeah, down a little bit more. Um, that per yeah, better? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So in, in 2008, shortly after you took over chair of the airboard, I vividly remember being in a, a glitzy Beverly Hills hotel at a, a summit that Governor Schwarzenegger put on. Uh, Barack Obama had just been uh, elected. He addressed the group by video. I had never seen a standing ovation for a video before. And he said uh, that, you know, people who care about climate change now have a friend in the White House. And there, there were cheers. And his future Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, spoke there. So take us back to that moment when, when similar to now, there was some a lot of um, expectations and excitement about climate progress in 2008. Well, yes. And similar to now, we also were coming out of an era when the federal government had been fighting against California and uh, working very actively uh, through EPA and the courts to deny California the right to set uh, emission standards for vehicles uh, for the greenhouse gases that are emitted by vehicles. So lo and behold, we're facing the same issue again. It's a, it's a repeat of that experience where we now have a new administration coming in, this time with an even broader set of commitments. And uh, frankly, I think a much longer list, a bigger bench of people that they're looking at for top positions across the government who get it that climate is uh, a major issue for our time. Uh, another difference, I think, which is significant is that we know that um, this election was propelled in significant part by young voters and that um, climate is one of their top issues. So uh, politically, climate has become relevant in a way that it wasn't before. Now, you mentioned top government officials in the Biden administration. You're on the short list to run EPA. I know uh, you, you, you're not sure if that's good, you're going to get that call. But what do you think the next EPA administrator should do after we've had four years of, the, of really demoralized staff at the EPA, a lot of rollbacks? It's been really, really tough time for that agency. Budget cuts, staff cuts, you name it. Yeah, EPA has really been hollowed out. Uh, there are many vacant positions and many strong people with experience and knowledge and commitment left because they just couldn't stand the uh, political leadership that was trying to subvert the very mission of the agency. Uh, to me, restoring EPA's integrity and its competence is a key element of the administration being able to meet its climate goals because while it certainly isn't enough uh, to take on the breadth of this problem, the Clean Air Act remains the single best legal tool that we have to regulate the sources and causes of climate change. And it certainly is one important ingredient, especially when it comes to motor vehicles. I think, though, for the agency as a whole, because even though clean air is usually the thing that gets the most attention. There are many other important programs uh, at EPA, not least of which is clean water, providing safe drinking water and fishable, swimmable rivers, uh, dealing with polluted landscapes around the country, toxic chemicals. These are all part of the agency's mission. Uh, but when it comes to the entire agency, the number one, um, I think, uh, platform on which it has to stand is the role of science, that decisions are made for the protection of health and the environment, and they're made based on the best, best available science, and the agency itself helps to participate in going out and gathering that kind of science. They may not do all the studies themselves, they couldn't, but they can do some and they can work with people in the academic community, in the think tanks who are doing the science and they can sift through it and present the best of it for decision makers to act on. Right. And coming back to uh, to that California timeline, you know, in, in 2009, the auto industry, another recession, the auto industry was bailed out by federal taxpayers. Um, and, you know, 
the federal government took a big stake in, in General Motors and, and Chrysler. What kind of leverage did that give California and the federal government to kind of accelerate and increase the CAFE standards for the first time in almost, what, 20 years? So there, there had been a couple of decades in which there had been no action on fuel economy standards and uh, a great resistance on the part of uh, the Bush administration to setting an emission standard for greenhouse gases. There was the Supreme Court had to tell uh, the administration that they had to at least consider setting an emission standard for greenhouse gases. So we were starting from a pretty uh, low point, but um, this, the fact that the industry had been through the near-death experience. Uh, I do want to say that, you know, not all the companies had to be bailed out, and even General Motors and Chrysler were paying back the loans that they had gotten from the federal government. So it wasn't as though they had their arms twisted behind their back and had to sign something, you know, upon pain of, uh, of death. But it is true that the intense experience that they had been through made them more receptive when they got the call from the White House saying, we want to talk to you about emissions. And um, undoubtedly, at that point, they were looking ahead towards their future and in a at least a more receptive mode to the idea that there could be some kind of shared responsibility between government and the private sector for advancing the cause of, uh, of climate change and of, of fostering independence from petroleum. So it was, a, it was definitely a, a pivotal moment. Though, you know, uh, I think taxpayers made money on their General Motors stock. They paid back the loans, uh, as you said, but they have short memories. Uh, as soon as Donald Trump was elected, the auto industry was the first industry to uh, issue a statement saying, we want some relief, we want some regulatory rollback, right? And uh, how did that work out for them? They, they, they were, as far as I can remember, first out of the gun after the election saying, okay, we want some relief. And they got perhaps more than what they bargained for. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the first trips, it may have been the first that he made after he took office uh, by President, one of, one of President Trump's first trips was to meet with auto executives uh, in the Detroit area. And it was with the idea that <clears throat> he was going to work with them, he was going to help them, give them regulatory relief in return for them, opening up new plants and creating new jobs in the United States. Uh, that was his objective. And he believed as a matter of principle, that the way to get that would be to hand them a bunch of regulatory rollbacks. Uh, they never quite said that that was what would happen, and it didn't happen. Uh, but he did, in fact, believe it, and he persisted in granting them more relief than they had actually asked for uh, in that meeting or any time afterwards, because they quickly realized, once the news of this meeting uh, got out, that they were making more enemies than they were friends among consumer organizations, among uh, many uh, members of Congress uh, and others, it wasn't just that the environmentalists were upset about this. It was a much bigger deal uh, that they were seemed to be demanding uh, to completely freeze any kind of um, standards that related to, uh, to fuel economy or greenhouse gas emissions and just said they couldn't do it. I remember there was a Bloomberg conference, I think it was last year, where uh, Andrew Wheeler, EPA administrator, was there. I interviewed him. You met with him separately at that same conference. Uh, what was that sitting down, like sitting down with him at the point where he was saying that uh, fuel efficiency increases uh, would cost consumers money more on because the purchase of the car would be higher. I think you probably said that uh, consumers with higher efficiency vehicles, they'll save money on gasoline over the life of the car. What was that like sitting down with Andrew Wheeler one on one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in the public meeting, we had a flat disagreement about the facts. Uh, uh, he didn't back down. And of course, I didn't back down either. I think I won on points in terms of the information that I was able to marshal. But uh, afterwards, there was a luncheon at these conferences. The Bloomberg people always invite all the speakers and other poobahs that are there to come and have lunch. And so um, he got there before I did and there was an empty seat uh, next to him. So I went over and sat down next to him um, and I just had a chat with him about 
hiking and various other things. We didn't talk about the issues at all because when you've got somebody whose mind is that set, okay. my experience is particularly in a setting where there were other people around eagerly hanging on this conversation, there's just no point thinking you're going to get anywhere with uh, any kind of an argument. Then this actually, this split uh, the auto industry. Some companies sided with California. Some companies sided with the Trump administration. How did that play out? And what does that bring us to today where some companies uh, basically sided with a relaxed rule? Some companies sided with California. How did that shake out? Well, first of all, um, there was a period of time during which supposedly the administration was going to try to negotiate with California to see if we could come up with a compromise between zero and the California uh, regulations. That did not work out. And there's a long twisted history about that. But essentially, uh, the administration was not talking to the industry or labor or consumers or anybody else. They just started from the position, which was an ideological position, that there should not be any use of these uh, emission standards that might impact on fuel economy. So they, they weren't interested in having a real conversation. Uh, when that became clear and we reverted to um, litigation mode, uh, the companies faced a choice. They could either side with the administration or stay out or they could throw in their lot with California. And um, as I think everybody knows, General Motors and Toyota, who were the big dogs in the trade association, swung their weight behind joining with the Trump administration. Um, there, they had arguments uh, that they made, you know, in private as well as in public that basically boiled down to the fact that they felt like they were being pressured by the Trump administration into siding with them. And they felt that they were potentially at risk because uh, the president has other tools at his disposal um, in terms of trade sanctions and uh, rulings on various labor and health issues and so forth, in which he could have made their lives much, much more difficult. And so they wanted to be siding with the federal government. Uh, and they had lawyers advising them that this might be their big opportunity to escape from the uh, heavy hand of California regulations as well. So the, their public argument was that they in, intervened in the litigation because they wanted a seat at the table. But they all, uh, those that, that joined the litigation, took the position that uh, California shouldn't be allowed to set emission standards for greenhouse gases. Uh, over time, some of the companies that did not support that position, this was a vote within the trade organization. And while their voting may not be quite as complex as the uh, electoral college, it's, you know, it's a complicated waiting vote, weighted voting system. Some of the companies that didn't support this idea approached California to see if there was a way that they could uh, work around that. And eventually what happened was uh, that we uh, did negotiate a framework agreement which was a, a compromise between no further improvements and the California only regulation, which we believed would get to the same overall benefit in terms of reduced uh, greenhouse gases if the companies would uh, apply it on a nationwide basis. And so led by Ford Motor Company, uh, but also with the uh, you know, strong leadership and support from uh, from Honda and BMW and Volkswagen, eventually Audi and uh, you know Volvo, um, we arrived at this uh, voluntary agreement, uh, which is like an enforceable contract with these companies, whereby they agreed to meet a higher standard across their whole national sales fleet, and uh, and to uh, not. Uh, not attack California's legal jurisdiction here. Uh, and I, I do think there's a common thread here in terms of my involvement, which is that it's about the, it's about the merits. It's about getting the results and the, and the environmental benefits, but it's also about protecting California's right to set standards because that has been time and time again, 
the one tool that we, the people as a whole, have had to really force progress on the part of uh, a part of the industry. And that exception, that ability to uh, set higher standards under the Clean Air Act is not enshrined in legislation. It could be challenged. Um, are you gonna, does California want to enshrine it in national legislation? And are you concerned that a 6-3 conservative Supreme Court could uh, challenge California's right to set cleaner pollution standards that then become national standards? I don't agree with the basis of your question. I think it's important to recognize that our position is that the original 1970 Clean Air Act, which has been reenacted or, or uh, amended but improved over time, uh, does state that California has the right to set more stringent standards for any pollutant, uh, regardless of whether the federal government is regulating that pollutant or not. Uh, the only condition is that we have to get a waiver from EPA and that we have to demonstrate technical feasibility and a need for the stricter standards. And that's what we've done hundreds of times over the years. And that's what we are, are doing again with greenhouse gases. That topic is in litigation. Uh, and of course, uh, we don't know ultimately what will happen. Uh, but uh, President-elect Biden has indicated that he's not going to support the position that the Trump administration took on that. So, in fact, it may never get to uh, the Supreme Court for adjudication because uh, we'll go back to what we have enjoyed in the past, which is a, a relationship of collaboration with the federal government. Right, and that's happened under Republican and, and Democratic presidential administrations. Uh, Trump sued California. California also sued the Trump administration. Uh, what happens to the, all that litigation? How many times did you sue the Trump administration, and do those cases now go away? Well, uh, I believe that uh, Attorney General Becerra has filed, <clears throat> excuse me, 58 cases uh, against uh, the uh, Trump administration's EPA for a whole wide variety of policy changes and regulatory changes, rule rollbacks, et cetera. Uh, and many of those have been disposed of and, and we've won them. We have not lost any of them. Uh, so uh, what remains of the existing portfolio, uh, I'm I can't say for each one of those cases, but in general, I believe that the overall volume of work for our lawyers will go down. <laughs> uh, what are some of the, personally speaking, what are some of the sweetest victories and bitterest moments in 13 years battling uh, lots of environmentalists, battling uh, oil companies, battling the federal government? What are some of the, the highs and lows for you personally? Well, you cited the um, at the outset of this conversation um, the event uh, that Arnold hosted at the I think it was the Beverly Hilton Hotel with yep. you know leaders from around the world and uh, many state governors showed up uh, as as well as uh, business leaders and so forth to to talk about uh, climate change and um, that video from uh, President Obama. Uh, which was, I think it was shot, it was actually before he was even in office. It was, yeah, it was right. shot in his office with a, a wall of law books in the background, as I recall, yeah. not, not terribly high quality uh, production, but it was definitely Obama speaking. And it was thrilling. It was, it was thrilling because suddenly you realize a president of the United States, a person who is a history maker on many fronts, um, was actually embracing uh, action on climate change. And it was just, uh, it was stunning because it was a realization that what we were talking about wasn't some fringe idea uh, or some you know, kind of European conspiracy that Arnold was a part of. It was, uh, it was mainstream consensus that action needed to be taken to address climate change. And so it was, that was truly a high point from, from my perspective. Uh, uh, low points, uh, I don't dwell on them. I'm just not good at that. There's a, you know, there've been some bad, bad moments along the way. Certainly um, some of my uh, uh, conversations with uh, members of the outgoing administration uh, in, in which they were 
and fundamentally disrespectful uh, of California uh, were uh, definitely uh, low points in terms of my career uh, trajectory. But uh, I guess um, it, this may sound uh, uh, overconfident, but I believe that if you're right and you have the forces of right on your side and you can appeal to the public, ultimately um, you will win. And I think that's what's happening. It doesn't mean that we've solved the problem of uh, climate change, but at least we're beginning to amass the necessary forces to do something meaningful and big about it. Mary Nichols is chair of the California Air Resources Board, one of the most powerful climate agencies at the state or federal level of government. Mary has led the board for 13 years under Republican and Democratic governors. During her tenure, she's arguably done more to cut greenhouse gas emissions than any other policy leader in the country. She's retiring from the agency this year. Richard, the listener, writes, what with control of the Senate in Republican hands, can anything be done on climate? Well, first of all, as we um, are having this conversation, um, the control of uh, the Senate is not yet in Republican hands, although Mitch McConnell may believe it's going to be. Uh, there's many uh, forces at work and people who believe that uh, the two seats that are still in contention are going to go to Democrats, which would then uh, change the leadership completely. But the Senate is a you know, it's a it's a pretty uh, slow moving body in general. Um, the House is a lot more of an activist institution, as our Constitution has set it up, and they have been passing legislation and resolutions that make it clear that they intend to move on climate. And uh, I believe that they will uh, they will succeed in passing legislation. But I think it's really important to recognize, as the Biden administration is already showing, that um, climate action is not just about one particular law. In fact, there probably are you know, 10 laws that need to be changed or passed in order to get a grip on a problem that is so pervasive as the role of carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions uh, in our economy. However, if you look at um, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, the Department of Interior, the Department of Agriculture, Commerce, they all have a role to play through the missions that they are responsible for in shifting gears in the direction of reducing our impact on climate and making our whole uh, uh, society more resilient uh, in the face of the climate change that's already occurring. So um, this is a, it's, it's a huge undertaking, but it doesn't, uh, and it certainly should have, deserves to have, and I believe ultimately will have bipartisan support. But I don't think you can just look at the makeup right now and say, well, you'll never get anything passed, because I don't, I don't think that's true. Uh, another question from a listener, uh, that if you were appointed climate czar, which uh, Vice President, uh, President-elect Biden has talked about some kind of climate leader, uh, President Obama had one, um, if he named you climate czar, what would be your top five priorities? And how would you convince the public that these policies would be beneficial to our economy? Well, first of all, uh, I, I would not... Uh, be the best candidate to be the climate czar because my ancestors left Russia to get away from the czars, and I've never really accepted that as a as a good title. But uh, not to be facetious, but um, I do think that there should be somebody in the White House who leads the effort, as I said before, because it's so complicated and responsibility is spread all over the government. You really do need a strong uh, White House presence to make sure that everybody is pulling in the same direction and they're all collaborating, cooperating across the board. Uh, so that's kind of the process question. But in terms of what are the first things that should be done, um, certainly putting a stop to the war on uh, any kind of climate change action has got to be the number one thing. The, the scrubbing of any mention of climate change from everything from the uh, National Environmental Policy Act to websites for, uh, from NASA, uh, 
it's shameful. That is just shameful. And that has got to stop. Um, once we begin to recognize what the, what the science already shows, what the data show us, then I think we have to move in the direction of um, accelerating the recovery of our country from the COVID uh, virus to uh, put money uh, and find money to put into uh, building back uh, our infrastructure and providing stimulus in ways that support the transition to clean fuels, uh, clean energy, electrification of the transportation system. There's a need for some new technologies out there for sure, um, but there's also a lot that can be done with just accelerating the, the role um, the Obama administration did a lot when they were faced with a recession uh, to bring in a new era of solar energy and help to create a whole new American business that brought down the costs for consumers and created good jobs for people in manufacturing and installation of uh, solar facilities. And uh, we can do that again. And this time it's going to be easier because the um, uh, the current crisis is not one in which the banks have failed or there's lack of investors out there. We have private sector investors, venture capitalists, banks, et cetera, that will invest um, once people are able to go back to work. So uh, I think there's, uh, there's going to be a resurgence of activity around the clean tech and uh, green technology uh, uh, space, and um, I'm excited to see it all beginning to unfold. I'm going to ask you to just put that boom down a little bit more. We're still getting so yeah. Thank you. That, that's good. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Am I it's, coming through too loud? No, no. It's the it's the the pl the p's and plosives. Oh, um, oh, oh. Yes. Right. Um, the, uh, fracking was uh, a de uh, climate was an issue in this presidential election season more than any before. It made to the debate stage. It was thanks to Sunrise Movement and others, uh, and also a growing national consensus. Fr climate change was on the agenda more than before. Fracking was part of that. Uh, there's some talk about whether the new administration will ban fracking on public lands, what they should do about it. What's your position on fracking? Is it something to be banned, as some environmentalists would like, or it should be more closely regulated? It's regulated at the state level, but how should, it's, how should we approach fracking? Well, the federal government does have a responsibility for protecting federal lands, and, and, and they need to do that, um, whether it's through a blanket ban or more likely a somewhat more um, focused, uh, you know, on different areas. I think in general, there's got to be a, a change in philosophy from the, you know, let's just drill everything um, philosophy, which, by the way, as a parting shot, I believe the president is now trying to open up both more of Alaska and offshore California for oil drilling. So you know, we have a long history of fighting uh, that one. That's, I think this is where I came in when I moved to California in 1971 was they were battling over, uh, over offshore oil platforms. But um, the, I think that the uh, uh, question of what happens on private land is more complicated. In California, uh, we need legislation to actually ban fracking. It's a technique that has been used for oil development in the state for many years, and it has it has different uh, effects. It's no question it it has effects on people who live near any kind of oil development activities. That there's water and air impacts and there need to be protections for humans uh, from this activity. But overall, the goal has got to be reducing our dependence on petroleum, whether it's imported or produced domestically. Um, we just need to be using less of it. And then I think you can phase down the development because uh, as happened with coal, it becomes uneconomic if people are not burning the stuff. 
Right, and the, the attacking fracking is does attack supply doesn't do anything uh, on the demand side. You know, you probably get this as much as I do. You know, individuals say, "What can I do?" And there's quite a debate. Some people will say, "Policy is what matters," Pol because climate is so big. Policy, policy, policy. We need policy. And other people will say, "Hey, individual action is important, incremental. I want to do the right thing." What do you? Where do you come down on the individual action? Kind of spectrum in terms of is it significant or is it a distraction that away from the bigger systemic things? Individual action is um, not a distraction. In fact, it's essential. Um, if people are not interested in the topic, even if you have leaders at the very top who are saying, yes, we want to take action, they won't get the support that they need. And I think we've seen uh, certainly in the United States and in other, uh, in other democratic societies that um, change flows from the bottom up, mm -hmm. not from the top down. You have to have people who are willing and able to buy the cleaner vehicles, uh, to invest in the new technologies, and to um, move to places that are less dependent on having to drive long distances. You know, you've got to change the economy and the marketplace, and that requires action on the part of the people as they are acting as consumers, as citizens at the local level and who they elect, but also just the choices they make of what to buy and, and how to live. Um, without that, the politicians, even if they may articulate the vision, are not going to have the ability to actually move forward and make policy. It's a but it's interactive. Again, as we've seen um, most recently with this um, response or lack of response to the COVID uh, crisis in our country, if you don't have national leaders who are willing to set policy and say, wear a mask, uh, then you also uh, don't get cooperation from the people because it's not seen as something that's important. It becomes, it becomes an issue for debate and therefore um, the problem just gets worse. So you, it, it's really not an either or discussion. It has to be both. Right, it's about the buy-in, more or less so I'm hearing you saying than the actual carbon reductions, but about it's the support, the buy-in, and, and part of uh, the fabric. Well, I mean, individual actions uh, do matter. They do add up in terms of actual tons reduced as well. I'm not saying it's only about attitudes, uh, but, uh, but it, it takes a lot of individual actions to add up to the kind of tons that you can get when you convert one power plant from coal uh, to renewables. We're talking about climate change and climate one. My guest is Mary Nichols, chair of the California Air Resources Board, the state's top climate chief. I'd like to go to our lightning round, which is a couple of uh, true or false questions. I know you like this part of this. Um, so uh, Mary Nichols, true or false, uh, Jerry Brown is so cheap that he usually lets other people pick up the check at dinner. True once, but not anymore. So I'm going to say false. <laughs> uh, true or false, Arnold Schwarzenegger used to fly you up from L.A. to San Francisco on his private jet so you could come and sit in the audience of front row of audience at Climb One, One events and you could field the really hard questions I might pose to him. <laughs> once. So true once. <laughs> Um, true or false, ride-hailing companies increase traffic congestion and the total number, number of car miles traveled? Ride-hailing companies increase total miles traveled and congestion. Um, I'm listening to the question. Uh, I don't think that's true. I'm hmm. going to say false. Okay. I think one study in San Francisco found that was certainly true. Um, you, true or false, you really don't like one word answers. <laughs> that is very true. Yeah, very true. Uh, I mean, again, your San Francisco study, I can't argue with the study, but I'll bet you there's one from someplace else that is not the same. Fair enough. Uh, this is association. What's the first thing that I'm going to mention a noun and then you say the first thing that comes to your mind unfiltered from your, uh, deep in your brain, Mary Nichols, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say hydrogen cars? Um, e easy to drive. 
What's the first thing that comes to mind when I say nuclear power? Um, exists. <laughs> it's out there. We use it. Uh, last one. What's the first thing that comes to mind when I say biofuels? Biofuels? Um, mixed, mixed environmental benefits, but uh, can be very positive. Thank you for that. Um, the country's had a racial reckoning this year, unlike you know, anything we've seen in, in decades. Uh, and perhaps one of the strongest criticisms of the California Air Board during your time was that it, it um, disadvantaged communities of color who were living near refineries, uh, factories. And there was a real environmental justice uh, criticism of California's climate plan. Initially, there were some changes and adaptations uh, made later to give it revenue to those, those communities, but address that chapter um, as one of the real um, tough debates that were that had in this, in this state over whether there was a lot of bias towards privileged wealthy people in California's climate plan. I'm going to try to frame that question a little bit differently, not to quibble with the way you've characterized it, but I think there is a question about environmental justice and whether it has been uh, at the center of the work that we do. And there's definitely been a growing awareness uh, on the part of people at the local, state, and federal level that communities have been left behind, left out, disproportionately impacted by pollution across the board. Um, the, the very term environmental justice at least first came to my awareness around issues of where um, waste facilities were being cited. Uh, there was a whole movement in our country, and it was in California too, to take care of solid waste by burning it to uh, make electricity, but to keep it away from landfills, which communities were uh, definitely trying to get rid of. And um, over time, it's become obvious that there's been less uh, active enforcement, less attention paid to the environmental uh, reality, the amount of pollution that people have had to live with in low income and communities of color in particular. So that's a reality. The legacy of racism in the way that zoning was done and housing was, was built uh, has left behind uh, whole areas, whole census tracts where um, people are more vulnerable and suffer worse pollution. That's, that is a real fact. And our, our programs were by and large not designed to take account of that. And so it's been a struggle when um, people have had to organize and really um, fight to get the attention uh, that they needed, and certain communities like Flint, Michigan, have you know become household words uh, because of the realization that they they were suffering from serious health impacts as a result of the neglect of uh, of environmental uh, amenities that they just people were not getting fair treatment. Um, the air program is no different it doesn't have a you know the the interesting thing or maybe i think it's an interesting thing is that our regulatory programs tend to focus on big regional scale not on localized impacts um, and the localized impacts which are mostly the toxic concentrations um, tend to be um, uh, dealt with at the local level, not by the state or the federal government. But we've come to realize that there, uh, there's no alternative, that the state has to get involved. And we have, um, fortunately, we've gotten some very strong legislation in the past few years. And from the very start of the um, market-based programs in the climate arena, uh, the legislature has um, directed a, a set aside of funds that came to the state to address the environmental inequities in some of the most uh, polluted, the most impacted communities in our state. So um, I think California has been a leader, not just in recognizing, but addressing the problems, but um, they certainly are not, uh, they're not solved. 
Uh, forests are a big part of the, the climate equation. We've seen American West has been on fire this year like never before, mega fires. It's, each year it seems to be escalating. Um, is that reducing, uh, going backwards when, when a forest burns, it releases a lot of carbon into the atmosphere? Is that undoing a lot of California's progress? And address the role of fires and forests in managing carbon and moving to a cleaner Fire is a, yeah. Fire is a necessary tool in restoring the health of our uh, of our forests. Uh, we have to be able to do controlled burning uh, in places where there hasn't been any burning allowed for years in order to reduce the severity, the spread, and the intensity of the fires. And anytime you burn anything, there is a release of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So there's no question that we as the government will be actually participating in putting emissions into the, into the atmosphere. But the uh, flip side of that, or the, the reason for that, is that if we don't do it, we will not be able to bring back healthy forests that will grow and store more carbon into the future. So, as often happens with uh, environmental um, issues, it's a little more complicated, but at the end of the day, uh, the fires themselves uh, are uh, have to be addressed, and the only way we can address them is by doing some burning uh, for the sake of restoring the forest. Right. So we have to do small burning so we don't get the really big, intense burning that damages homes and, and is, is more damaging of, of, uh, of, of the forest. Another part of uh, uh, forest was there's a forest offset program that it, some environmentalists have, have really criticized California for saying that it's not really uh, as solid as the state claims it to be, that, that, that there's credits for forests that are going to be managed far into the future. So address that controversy over forest offsets, which... Um, which some people were quite critical of the state for. So uh, within our cap and trade program, uh, we allow for a small amount of the compliance that companies have to uh, have to have to submit. A small amount of the allowances can be from offsets, and there is a market for these offsets. And if they are cheaper than the cost of uh, paying for more allowances from the auction, then uh, companies will invest in offsets. This is different from the voluntary offset market, which is one of those things that people sometimes contribute to. For example, if you take a flight and you want to make sure that your uh, flying isn't causing uh, more problems uh, for the atmosphere. You can buy offsets from a program to help uh, preserve tropical forests, and that is a, that is a, a, another whole use of the term offset. But within our program, we do allow some offsets uh, that come from. Uh, forest management that is uh, demonstrated to keep trees alive and healthy and absorbing more carbon uh, for a hundred years or more into the future. When we adopted the protocols for these offsets, we did it through third parties uh, who had to uh, consult broadly with the science and experts in the forestry community. And we also uh, put in provisions that require third party auditing and enforcement. And if offsets are found to have been um, done in a way that did not comply with the protocols or the entity that's trying to sell them is shown to have um, committed other environmental um, fraud or abuses in the past, those offsets can be invalidated and the person who has bought those offsets is just out of luck. They have to pay a penalty and go back and buy more allowances from, from the auction. So um, we view this as kind of a limited safety valve, but also an opportunity to um, get funds invested in um, 
beneficial programs that can't be funded any other way. And uh, I realize that there are people who believe it's just an offense to allow for any uh, private uh, compliance uh, that does not consist of pure regulation, but allows for uh, the market to do this. Um, I think it's one of those things we have to keep looking at continually, but I don't believe that it's uh, true that the offsets that have been created in California are uh, taking us backward. In fact, the opposite. We have uh, a model in a program that was um, uh, that was developed by the Yurok tribe in Northern California, which owns a lot of land that had very degraded uh, uh, forest resources. And they were able to uh, use the funds that they acquired from uh, offset uh, from the offset market to buy back some of their ancestral land and to invest in improving the overall health of their forests. This is a completely win-win situation. And it's one that it's maybe a small scale, uh, but it's really worth looking at to see how you can achieve both environmental and social benefits if you have uh, a well-run offset program. My guest today on Climate One is Mary Nichols, chair of the California Air Resources Board, the state's top climate agency. Uh, we have a listener question from Nilesh who asks, what regulations can EPA and state agencies adopt to promote organic and sustainable agriculture? That's a, a tremendous opportunity area. Uh, there already is uh, uh, one program that uh, uh, is operating uh, in California called the Healthy Soils Initiative, where um, they've used some of the funds that were generated from the cap and trade program, part of the greenhouse gas reduction fund, uh, to invest in helping farmers. It's a, uh, it, it has to be a partnership, and the, you know, the the rancher or farmer has to volunteer to be in the program, and they have to um, agree to the conditions. But then they also are eligible for funds to help pay for the cost of uh, more. Uh, organic and more climate-friendly agriculture, which basically means less less tilling of the soil. Uh, it's a it's been a very successful program. It's always oversubscribed. There's not enough funding for it, and and there really should be more. Um, in general, we do a lot better when we can find ways to um, match funds and to uh, get the agricultural community to work with the government on these programs um, because otherwise there's a tendency, I think, for uh, farmers uh, to feel like it's just um, one more layer of bureaucracy coming in and trying to tell them what to do and how to farm. So um, the Air Resources Board is not the frontline agency that uh, administers this program. It's done by our California Department of Food and Agriculture. They're, they're the ones who interface directly uh, with the landowners, but they work very closely with us on the guidelines and the documentation to make sure that we're really getting uh, the, the climate results that we're, that we're trying to get. And it's been a, just a terrific program. Leslie asks, listener, uh, do you think the Biden-Harris administration will increase incentives for purchasing electric cars? Right now, the federal government, it's, uh, a tax break um, has expired. So it will, it will take Congress to bring it back again. Um, direct rebates or tax breaks are, are certainly an important tool in getting over the first cost differential between electric and gasoline models. Although we're seeing the, that difference really coming down quickly. And some people have predicted that there will be no difference between between electric vehicles and gasoline-powered vehicles within just the next couple of years, which, uh, of course, is where we would like to end up. But until that happens, 
<clears throat> there probably is a need for incentives uh, to help people make the choice for something that is more uh, environmentally beneficial, even though in the long run, they will still save money over having to uh, pay for the gasoline and the servicing of, of a gasoline car because electric cars are much more durable and electricity in most places is still quite a bit cheaper um, than, than gasoline. Uh, so that's an important tool, but uh, even more important in decision-making uh, is the question of where you can get the, the fuel so you can actually use the vehicle whenever you want to and wherever you want to. The question of um, what they call range anxiety has been, a, has been an issue for years in terms of public acceptance or awareness that there really are electric vehicles uh, that will serve their purposes. And I'm happy to say that nowadays, all the newer uh, models of electric vehicles that are coming on the market for the passenger cars and the SUVs and lighter vehicles uh, are um, have uh, battery ranges in the 200 mile plus, uh, which is you know equivalent to the range that you need uh, for uh, for gas stations and. Um, States and hopefully soon the federal government are getting much more involved in helping to um, make sure that we have a network of chargers that is available to the public so that uh, people can really enjoy the benefits of, of electric vehicles. The, the auto companies are doing a good job of building attractive uh, ZEV, zero emission vehicles for all kinds of consumers. And now they need to match that with the fuel availability in places that are where people really need to fuel up. Well, as we began here, we talked about uh, Dieselgate and VW getting caught uh, cheating on their emissions, and California uh, uh, really played a key role in, in exposing that, that cheating. One of the penalties, consequences uh, was. VW building out a charging network across the country. How significant was that scandal in terms of changing not only VW, but the industry itself? The um, penalties that, uh, that Volkswagen paid for the cheating uh, that they did on their diesel vehicles mostly went to funds that were allocated to overcoming the uh, impacts of all the extra nitrogen oxide emissions that people were forced to breathe as a result of the cheating that went on. But cars that were sold and driven that should not have been allowed to emit at those, at those rates. So um, that money has been directly invested in most cases in turning over old school buses and getting newer buses or uh, cleaning up public fleets. But um, a portion of it went to um, an electric vehicle fund because one of the things that the company did as they were marketing these so-called clean diesel vehicles was to uh, try to hold back the market for electric vehicles by saying, oh, you don't need to do that. That's way uh, too expensive and unnecessary. You can just buy these very efficient, very clean diesel vehicles, and it will be at least as good for the environment, which of course wasn't true. So as part of their penalty, they had to put aside some funds for, um, for electric vehicle um, support. And in California, that led to the creation of uh, more, we had more funding to put into uh, public charging than any amount that the state had ever paid up until that point and any other grant programs that we had ever had. So it was a big deal. It is a big deal. But maybe more significant is the fact that once Volkswagen decided they were going to have to do this, they went all in. Um, they not only announced that they were changing their product plans to be all electric in the near future. And, you know, we know that they're using this as a springboard to change their image and to um, increase their market share worldwide because the demand for zero emission vehicles is a worldwide uh, 
uh, demand. But here in California, we have seen, and now across the country, we have seen that Electrify America, which was the company that they spun off, has been um, putting in stations and helping to build awareness and uh, make it possible for our country to shift over to zero carbon transportation. As we wrap up, we began talking about AB 32, California's landmark climate law, which uh, had the goal, required goal of reducing emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. California, I believe, met that even a little early. But the outlook for the goals going ahead the next 10 years are less rosy. There's some, been some recent projections that California is going to have a really hard time meeting its goals of the next decade. So could you address that, that a lot of the uh, so there's some concern that a lot of the low-hanging fruit has been picked and the next 10 years may be harder than the last 10 years in terms of driving deeper decarbonization. You know, um, having started my career working on air pollution back in the 1970s, I have heard this argument every time the standards got tighter or stricter that uh, all the low-hanging fruit is gone, everything that was affordable has been done, the next uh, slice is going to be way more expensive and way too difficult. Uh, and every time that argument has come up, we have continued to move forward in the direction of our clean air goals set based on health needs, and we have achieved them because technology rises to meet the challenge. It is a, a fact of life, which um, I think some people have a hard time accepting, that if you set strong standards and you create the conditions in which people can make money by developing and marketing the technologies that will help you meet those standards, you can do it. You keep on moving forward towards the direction of cleaner air, and we will keep on doing the same thing uh, as we not only clean up the air, but reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. It's not that it's easy. It, is, it, it isn't that there's something there just waiting to be done that's free and gosh, why hasn't just already been done? But if you have a choice in buying a new uh, urban bus or a choice in um, where your electricity is coming from and it arrives at, at, your, at your home or your workplace when you need it and is affordable, um, you don't really care uh, what power plant actually generated those electrons. And this is the the beauty of our system is that we have been able time and time again to find and use and reward uh, those who have come along with cleaner, better technologies for creating electricity, creating uh, cleaner fuels. Uh, I, I don't want to, you know, go too much into the ancient history, but when I first started working on air pollution, the power plants in the Los Angeles basin burned fuel oil. It was 3% sulfur fuel oil. It was, by today's standards, completely unacceptable. And we fought with the utilities for years and made the switch from uh, fuel oil to natural gas. And now, decades later, we're moving away from natural gas and in the direction of renewables. Um, each time there's been some resistance, it's not always uh, been a straight line, you know, quick, easy change. And it did require policy uh, to make it happen. But once the policy was there and people accepted that it was needed, uh, we got the we got the results that that we needed. And speaking of natural gas, that transition uh, to natural gas, there's now a transition away from natural gas. In fact, cities and states banning new gas hookups and new construction. You're coming to us from your home uh, in Los Angeles, Mary Nichols. I believe you have a convection of, uh, oven or stove. Tell us quickly: uh, Are you are you cooking <laughs> cooking without gas, and what's that like? Because that's kind of the the cool new thing. Well, I hate to say it, I have one of each in my house uh, because we have uh, an apartment and uh, and the uh, the kitchen that uh, is in the main house, um, and so I've used both of them. I was pretty suspicious of the uh, induction at first, but uh, I have learned how to manage it, and uh, it's it's doable. It wasn't the easiest change I've ever made, but it was definitely doable, and I like to cook. 
too. So I, I think if I could do it, uh, probably somebody who was a serious chef could do it more easily. And I got to get the name right. Name right. It's induction of and not convection of. And I'd like to give a shout out to the Climate One team here at the Commonwealth Club: Tyler Reed, Arnav Gupta, and Adam Anderson, Mark Kirshner, and Spencer Campbell. Thanks for coming in. Uh, on Climate One today, we've been discussing the legacy of Mary Nichols, who's chaired the California Air Resources Board since Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger appointed her in 2007. She's done arguably more than to cut greenhouse gases than any other elected or appointed official in the United States. And during her tenure, California has exported its climate policies to China, Canada, and other countries. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Please help us get more people talking about climate by telling a friend, giving us a rating, or review. It really does help advance the conversation. Thanks for joining us online. Thanks to Mary Nichols. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you.